And he said, great. So he will do, I believe, the Lord's Sacrament. We'll, do, we'll take communion together next Sunday. Um, so that was on me and, and Pastor John for not informing the uh, deacons. I told Oliver, but I didn't tell everybody else. So sorry, guys. That's, that's on us. For, good exercise. That's right. Good exercise. That's what I thought. I was thinking of you, Frank. Um, so, um, so that's that. Um, I know that we do have a couple of birthdays, but before we get to that, is there anything else I'm missing? There's nothing in the announcements. I think one of the real quick we welcome Donna. Who? I'm sorry. Thank you. Right down the way here. Donna, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Are you from around here? Yeah, I live right next door. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Donna, right? Yes. Okay, thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thank we have you. any other announcements? Miss Carol, you're, you're I'm late. I know. I'm sorry about that. I, well, I <laughs> saw you drive in. I didn't see you in the normal. Okay, all right. So I know that we uh, have two birthdays. Um, a couple of young guys in here. Daryl, correct? And Mr. Oliver. Okay, uh, are you going to tell us how young you are? Or? I'm going to get my social security. Okay, all we're going to get the social security. Good for you. Daryl? I've been drawing social security for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we'll go Daryl and Oliver first. Here we go.
Father, you are exalted, Lord, um, and you are holy, holy, holy. Um, as we look at just today's section of Scripture, help us to remind that remind us of that word that that you are God and you are God alone. Um, and help us to worship you in spirit and truth, Lord. Again, we ask that you would be with Pastor John as he's not here today, um, just ministering to his family and hopefully being ministered to, Lord. And we just pray that you would be, be with us now as we fellowship. We give you all the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us greet one another, Lord. Our reading today is from Psalm 135, verses 5 through 13. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the ends of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. He it was who smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and of beast, who in thy midst, O Egypt, sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants who smote many nations and slew mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to his people Israel. Thy name, O Lord, endures forever. Thy renown, O Lord, throughout all the ages. Hallelujah and amen. <coughs> We could have the uh, children come forward. Bear with for coming through. Isaiah is going by the bear whisperer now because he uh, had a bear encounter on our property. So ask him all about it. He'd love to tell <laughs>
use these gifts um, that we've given to you, Lord, which were given to us by you um, for your glory and for your purpose. In Jesus' name. Okay, please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 24. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 24. And again, like we have been in the habit of, at least as of late, we're going to read a large section of Scripture, um, and, then, and then we'll dive into it. So Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 24. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I can wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said about this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had received, excuse me, conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, and have done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. And as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So that it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth, so that he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Well, what is molded say to what's molder? What, it, what have you made me like this? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us whom he has called not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Amen. I 
I had contemplated it is very difficult for me because Pastor John and I are in this, our lockstep with almost every single theological issue and with how we think the Bible should be presented week in and week out, which is go through a book, verse by verse, explain it, and then apply it to you as the church, as the congregation. We both agree with that as elders. And we both agree that it doesn't matter what's said, we just want to give you the whole counsel of God. And so I called him and I said, <laughs> I laughed. I said, hey, bro, I have no idea, but I feel like I'm supposed to teach on Romans 9, which is not the exact, let's just pick this up out of nowhere, right? But as I, it's hard for me because, again, I'm used to just picking a book and going through it. So then you don't have to, you know, decide and pray through it. It's just, hey, this is what the next text is. This is what we get a look at. And so I called him and I said, hey, this is what I think the Lord wants me to do. Um, what do you think? And he goes, well, I'm good with it. You do what you do what the Lord is telling you to do. And he does the same thing with me when he talks about where he's going next. I said, hey, totally trust it. You're the person who's in there most weeks. You just do whatever you think the Lord's telling you to do. Now, if you were to start picking and choosing selective passages all the time, then I think one of us would push back on each other, right? But I'm just kind of pulpit supply when he is gone. So when we're looking at Romans 9, and as you read it out loud, a lot of people go, this is controversial. And I would say it's not controversial at all. The only way it becomes controversial is if you would like to change things that are in there that make you feel uncomfortable. Now, having said that, I understand the challenges that lie ahead as far as how do we interpret this and how does our infinite mind go to the finite? How do we, as the clay, look to the potter and say, how does this make sense? Because on a human level, it's sometimes we go, ooh, that's kind of like the opposite. And we're going to deal with all of those issues. So the first thing that I would say is, is that we are, as the sermon title says, surveying the sovereign God. If we just took what we took, verse 1 through 24, we could be here for a month of Sundays, two Sundays. However, you could spend a lot, a lot of time on this. And I would say this. Romans 9 isn't more important than John 3 or any other passage. They're all inspired, right? They're all inspired. But there are some issues that arise here. So what I want us to do is just remember, this is a survey. I am not going to preach 286 sermons out of the book of Romans like John Piper. That's not my intention here. My intention is 30,000 foot view and let's look at the text. Let's get a big picture. Okay? Okay. Now, before we start our survey, I want to give us two guides that I think will help us to understand this chapter and one admonition. First, the guide. Why is Romans 9 written? You always want to ask that about any section of Scripture. Why is this in here? And why is it in here now? Well, Romans chapter 9 verses, or chapters 9 through 11 exist specifically and are put in to Romans specifically at this point because he has to answer the question of if God's word has failed, right? In verse 6. Why does he say that? But it is not as though that God's word has failed. He has to say that because of the promises made in Romans chapter 8. Remember in Romans chapter 8 when he says that if you were foreknown, then you're predestined, then you were called, then you were justified, and then you were glorified. And then he goes into this great crescendo that kind of caps off Romans chapters 3 through 8 by saying, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not height, nor depths, nor demons, nor anything. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And then a natural question is going to come up. What's the question? What the heck happened to Israel then? How can we take Romans 8 seriously and take that as the rock solid foundation of our faith that if God saved you, he's going to keep you? If we look at the nation of Israel, because almost nobody believes in the Messiah and the nation of Israel when this is written. 
You have to answer that question. Because really it starts with a ragtag group of 12 guys and some women that believe in the Messiah. So it would appear that God's word has failed because to be an Israelite in the Old Testament sense is equated with what? Being God's chosen people. So how can I put my head on the pillow at night and rest easy if I go, well, it didn't work for the nation of Israel. What the heck happened to them? Romans chapters 9 through 11, 11 answers that question. I'm going to tell you what happened to the nation of Israel. I'll explain it so then you can take hold of that promise in Romans 8 and go, it's unshakable. God's got me. Nothing will separate me from the love of God. Number one, we have to understand why Romans 9 through 11 were written. It's because he's explaining why you can take seriously the promise in chapter 8 of Romans. Everybody needs to make sure that that's the filter we're looking at here. Guide point number two, and this is a really important one. All we need to understand Romans 9 is Romans 9. And the Old Testament uh, verses that are quoted in Romans 9. And I say that because I remember the first couple times I was taught Roman 9, Romans 9, the pastor spent so much time and energy explaining that it doesn't mean what it clearly says it means. <laughs> and I just felt like I was like, you are spending a lot of energy trying to convince me that it doesn't say what it naturally says. I don't understand that. And then he would go to John 3.16 and he would go to other places about personal responsibility and I'm going, you're teaching this passage the exact opposite way you teach almost every other passage. Know this. If you want to know what a passage says, look in the passage first. If you can't find it in that passage, look in the chapter. If you can't find it in the chapter, look in the book. If you can't find it in the book, look in the Testament. If you can't find it in the New Testament, if it's in the New Testament, look in the Old Testament. If you can't find it in the New Old, New or Old Testament, say... I don't know, right? We are sola scriptura here. I only want to know what the scripture says, okay? But I think, and I submit to you, that when we look at Romans 9, the answers will be in Romans 9, coupled with the Old Testament verses that Paul quotes. And remember this, when you're studying scripture, if a New Testament author quotes an Old Testament passage, he's using it correctly. Why? Because he's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So when Paul takes Exodus and he applies it to the situation he's talking about in Romans 9, he does it perfectly because he's doing it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? So we can know for sure when he applies Exodus 33, when he applies Malachi 1, and we'll look at all of those, that we can go, he's doing it right. He's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Remember, men didn't write the Bible. They were just a tool. They're just the pen in God's hand. That's it. God writes the Bible. Men are the tools. All we need to understand Romans 9 is Romans 9 and the Old Testament passages that are quoted there, which there are six in Romans 9 approximately. Now, Third, my admonition to you is let the passage speak. Don't try to use human reasoning to create a God that you're comfortable with because at times it might get uncomfortable in Romans 9. And don't think Romans 9 cancels out other sections of Scripture because it doesn't. And we'll talk about that as well. Just like on a coin, there's a heads and there's a tails. Both things can be true, and we will touch on that in the end. But I say that in cautioning you, because we are talking about the sovereignty of God and all things in this passage. We are not going to be talking about the responsibility of man primarily. Just if I were to teach on the love of God, Right? You shouldn't be upset because I don't mention the wrath of God. When I teach on the wrath of God, you shouldn't be upset at me if I don't mention the love of God. We're looking specifically 
the supremacy of God, and that he is sovereign over all. That's what we're going to be looking at today. So just take that side of the coin. Now, before we dive in, what does it mean that God is sovereign? Now, uh, we covered this in discipleship class last week, um, or a couple weeks ago, and I would say that this is my favorite definition of what it means for God to be sovereign. It's from A.W. Pink, but I think it kind of summarizes it best. So when we're talking about that God is sovereign, what does that mean? Here's what he says. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the Almighty, the possessor of all power in heaven and earth, so that none can defeat his counsel, thwart his purpose, or resist his will. The sovereignty of God of Scripture is absolute, irresistible, infinite. To put it now in the strongest form, we insist that God does as he pleases, only as he pleases, always as he pleases, that whatever takes place in time is but the outworking of which he has decreed in eternity. To put it plainly, and now this is me speaking, nothing happens without God ordaining and decreeing that it will happen. Not even a sparrow falls to the ground apart from the Father's will. And if you can walk in that, you can walk in some serious peace and contentness, no matter what comes your way. Now, let's start to dive into the text. There's three main points I want to make here. One, because God is sovereign in election, God's word can be trusted. Two, God is totally just and free to lavish on whomever he wants his mercy and vice versa, his hardening. Three, God has the right to do what he wants with his creation because he is the potter and we are the clay. Now, I've made those statements that I think that's what this chapter is about. So your job, and your job will always be, as long as you sit in the pew, I do it with Pastor John, is that I go, prove it from the text. Explain it. You say that that's what this passage means? Explain it. Okay? The last thing that I'll say is, and my tone will change a little bit now, this is supposed to be pastoral. When Paul is explaining this in Romans 9. He is not finding his Arminian friend and then saying, <laughs> I'm going to destroy you in some argument. He's saying, listen, I'm explaining this to you so you can take seriously again Romans 8. So this is not a way to club somebody over the head to win an argument. Let's look at point one. Because God is sovereign in election, God's word can be trusted. We won't read all the sections again, but I do want to read this section. Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 13. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not, not, not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, had done neither good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, The older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So, it's not as though the word of God has failed. And the reason that the word of God has failed is because, specifically, of the doctrine of unconditional election. That's why we can know that Israel hasn't just gone off on plan B or C and screwed everything up in God's plan. Because of the doctrine of unconditional election. Now, what do we mean, unconditional election? When we say that God has unconditionally elected someone, what we are saying is that it is God who chose someone to be a vessel of mercy and to experience salvation. 
and that that choice is not based on any condition met by the person. It is not based on the person's ethnicity, not on their family tree, not on the order of their birth, not on the basis of anything that that person will do. No works, no efforts. When we say unconditional election, we are simply saying because God has chosen them for his own glory and purpose to be elected for salvation. So whatever your definition is, that's what I would say our definition is as an elder team that teaches you. Now, we can see that unconditional election is in, in this passage is very clear. So let's just start walking through. The first thing that's mentioned, right, is what? Not all Israel is Israel. What does that mean? Well, that means that within ethnic Israel... There was a spiritual Israel that really belonged to God. Now, we don't have time to go through every Old Testament passage, right? Okay? But I think if you read the Old Testament, you can realize that the vast majority of ethnic Israel did not follow God faithfully, right? They weren't believing God's, by, uh, God's promises by faith, right? They didn't do that. So Paul's first argument is, hey, not all Israel is Israel. Just like some of us would say, not all Americans are Americans, meaning patriots, right? We would say, some of us would say stuff like that, right? Now, I'm not trying to get political here, but you understand the argument here. Not all ethnic Israel is spiritual Israel and belongs to Yahweh in their heart. That's argument number one, okay? Just because you, and then he goes on to say, just because you claim Abraham as your lineage doesn't mean that you get to claim relationship with God, right? That's what he's saying. We say that to our children during family worship probably once a week. Just because Brooke and I believe doesn't mean that you guys believe. That's not how it works. So not all Israel is Israel, and just because you can claim Abraham in your lineage doesn't mean that you're spiritual Israel. There's an Israel within Israel, okay? Now, the next one is, it's through the promise, the children of promise, right? So he goes on to say after that, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as offspring. What is he saying there? He's contrasting, right? There's the children of promise, and the children of the flesh, right, with Isaac. Because Abraham, when he's promised these great descendants, he's older than both of our young men today when we sang happy birthday, right? He's in his 90s. So is Sarah, okay? And so what does Abraham have to do with that promise? Does he go, oh, I'm just going to walk by faith and God's going to do it, even though Sarah's womb is totally dead, he'll make it happen? No, he doesn't do that. He says... I'm going to give God a little assist here. We're going to take Hagar. That's a great plan. I'll sleep with her. We'll have our own kid. And then, boom, God's off the hook. Doesn't work that way. Okay? Okay? And God has to remind him, hey, Ishmael is not going to be your heir. Now, remember this. Ishmael's his firstborn. This would have been extremely personal. Right? Okay? So when he says that it's the children of promise, what is God emphasizing? He's saying, I don't need your help in making my plans and promises to come true. I'm going to take you, a really old man, and her, a really old woman, who has no business producing a child, and I'm going to make it happen. It's going to be supernatural. It's not going to be of the flesh. You're not going to work for it. You're not going to have anything to do with it. It's going to be me. So the next one is the promise and the flesh. So we have, there's Israel within Israel. And then the next example that he gives is the promise. It's not of the flesh. It's of the promise. It's going to be supernatural. Well, then an argument pops up. Now, I want to point this out. Notice what Paul is doing here. Okay, if you follow this long enough throughout Romans, he keeps answering arguments that people are going to keep bringing up, right? 
it changed my mind on how I read the Bible, especially Romans, because I've spent probably the most time in Romans because I wanted to understand certain things for whatever reason, that Paul is arguing. He goes, I know what your next argument is, and so I'm going to answer that argument in the context. And that's why I said we don't have to go out of Romans then. Because here's the next argument that comes up. And you can kind of see it with the flow of, of, of thought here. Paul knows that the argument is coming that, well, Hagar and, you know, the Ishmael and the Isaac thing, that's not really the best way to prove unconditional election because Hagar is not a Jew. So, of course, it's not going to be Ishmael. Of course, it has to be Isaac. That's a terrible argument, Paul. That's a bad argument. And then Paul goes, oh, really? Let me give you another illustration to really drive home the point that it is unconditional election. So that's verses 10 through 13 for the next illustration with our favorites, Jacob and Esau. Okay, that's the next argument. So there's Israel within Israel. There's the promise versus the flesh. And now we say, and I'm going to really make an airtight case that it's unconditional election. That I'm the one who's making the ultimate decision. And therefore you can trust Romans 8. What is that airtight argument of unconditional election? It's Jacob and Esau. Now notice how he says it here. He says, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man. How many men can you have conceive a child, right? It's only one. He's emphasizing something here. By one man our forefather Isaac. And then he says... Though they were not yet born and had done neither evil or neither good or bad. Now let's just look at that for a second here. One man, one woman. Okay? So the whole Ishmael, Hagar thing, that argument goes away. Right? But then what about firstborn and all that stuff? They're twins. They're twins. They both have the same father, the same mother. They're both purely Israelites. And then somebody might say, well... Okay, but Jacob, he followed God, and Esau, he was a terrible guy. And I would say, have you read the Bible? Yeah. <laughs> right? right? Yeah. Jacob was a scheming mama's boy who didn't hunt. <laughs> right? That's who Jacob was. Esau had his own issues, right? Didn't value his birthright, all of that stuff. What does Jacob do? He exploits it, and he swindles it. But why does Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, say this? Not yet born, and had done ne ne nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Because he knows that argument is coming. So Paul just says, I'm going to deal with this up front. It's not about Jacob and Esau and how they're living. What is it about? Election. Unconditionally. It doesn't matter if you're from Israel. It doesn't matter if you have the lineage of Abraham. It doesn't matter about the promise in the flesh. It's the promise. It doesn't matter that you do good and have faith. What matters is election. Now, I'm not saying faith doesn't matter. We will touch on that. But the point, and I think it's just unmistakable here, that Paul is driving home is, I choose. God chooses. And I do it before people are born. So that election might stand. That's what it says. Then he backs it up with the statement. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now some people will say that this statement just means that God loved Esau a little less. That is not true. Malachi chapter 1, where this verse is quoted from here, makes that really clear. Listen to Malachi chapter 1. This is God speaking. Verse 2 says, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? And God responds, is that Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste this hill country and left this heritage to jackals of the desert. That's not loving less. 
That's vessel of honor, vessel of mercy, and vessel of dishonor, and vessel of wrath. That's not loving less. That's unconditional election. And notice what Israel responds. How have you loved us, God, in comparison with everybody else? And he says, wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? Weren't they twins in the same womb? Didn't they have the same father? Why couldn't I have chosen Esau? Because I didn't. I chose you. And I loved you. That's unconditional election. Make no mistake about it. Paul knows that we're going to have these questions come up. Heck, I did for years. But Paul answers them. And he says, how have I loved you? I chose you, Jacob. And then again, you can't say that he loved Esau less. Why? Because he leaves everything desolate for Esau. He's displaying his wrath on Esau. Unconditional election, in my humble opinion, is extremely important. You can't take Romans 8 seriously, in my opinion, if you don't take unconditional election seriously. Right? Amen. You just can't do it. So, in closing here, for application, why does it matter that God is sovereign in unconditional election? I know this doesn't satisfy a lot of people because the Bible says so. That's number one. Right? I, that's how I live my life. That's the filter I live my life through. If the Bible says it, I believe it. That's it. And then I'll figure, ask God to straighten me out with different things as we go along. But number two, because if you think that the ball is ultimately in the people's court, then Romans 8 becomes a lot less shaky. Or becomes a lot more shaky, excuse me. If you think that it's you and your faith and your ability to walk through this life with the Lord, do you look at Romans 8 in the same way that nothing will separate you from the love of God? I certainly don't. I make decisions all the time that I go, oh, why did I take this responsibility on? Why did I do this? Or I just flake. Unconditional election takes that away because God chose you as a vessel of mercy for his own glory and purposes, as we will see. It has nothing to do with you. Nothing. Why does God love you or us? Because he does. And for his own glory. And therefore, I am ultimately depending on God to keep me until that fateful day when he calls me home, whatever that might be. Now let's look at point number two. God is just, and this is key, free to have mercy on whom he will. I said we weren't going to read every passage. That's a lie. We are. Okay. <laughs> Verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So that it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So that he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Now, again, look at verse 14. He knows what people are going to say. They're going to say, well, if he chooses before he's born, is that right? Is that just? Doesn't that make God not just? And Paul is going to answer that question, so we don't need to go outside Romans 9. Okay? So what is Paul's answer to the question if God is unjust? By no means, he says. So he answers it extremely clearly. Now, I want you to think about that. He answers it by no means. Number one, you have to ask yourself this question. Does that question come up from the guy in the crowd? Imagine Paul is teaching this, and the guy in the back goes, Yeah, but doesn't that make God unjust? Right? Ask yourself, does that question come up if Paul's answer to election is, Well, God saw that Esau would be bad and that 
Jacob would be good? Does that question come up? No, the question doesn't come up because people would go, well, of course he chose Jacob because he saw through the corridors of time that Jacob would choose him and so therefore God chose Jacob. That question doesn't come up if that's Paul's response. And couldn't Paul have said that right in Romans 9? Okay, I see you're confused. Well, here's how come God is not unjust. Because Jacob believed and Esau didn't. That's why. He doesn't say that though, does he? He says directly, by no means. That's what he says. He just answers it directly. No, nope, that's not the case. By no means. In the Greek, I think it says, go omi, which is emphatic. That's why there's the exclamation there. Okay? Now, we have to ask the question and unravel, but why and how? And this passage can be, I don't think it's tricky, but you need to think deeply on this one. So I gave three reasons why God is not unjust for choosing before they're born, right? Because that's the question we're dealing with, right? Is everybody tracking with me here? Well, number one, first reason it's not unjust, and it's emphasized in this passage, because it's mercy in the first place. I will have mercy on you, I will have mercy. Remember this, you deserve the wrath of God. So does Jacob. So does Esau. If it's not mercy, if it's, or excuse me, if it's owed to you, it no longer becomes mercy and grace, right? When I show up to South Kitsap, every month I get my salary at the end. That's not, oh, thanks for the payoff. No, that's my due, man. I work for you guys, you guys owe me. Mercy is not receiving what you deserve. So my first answer, the reason why God is not unjust, is because he's dealing in the realm of mercy. Remember what Romans 3 have said. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right? If I'm walking down the road, and let's say there's 10 homeless people, and I've got 7 bucks in my pocket, 7 ones, and I decide to give 7 people dollar bills, and I don't give dollar bills to the other three people. Have I done the other people an injustice by not giving them money? No. Because I don't owe them any money. If ten men come and burn down my house and do terrible things to my family and kill them all, and then they're all lined up, and for whatever reason, I tell the judge, and it's within my power, those three get to go free. These seven, they're hanging. Have I done any wrong to the seven that have to hang? No. I've just decided that three of them get to have mercy. And that seven of them get what they deserve. One of the reasons that it can't be claimed that God is unjust for choosing Jacob and Esau is because we're dealing in the realm of mercy here. God doesn't owe us a savior. He just, he, that's not like, oh, you're obligated to, oh, to give us a Savior because you created us. That's nowhere in Scripture. We're dealing in the realm of mercy here. Remember that. Now, number two. Because he is God, and to be God is to be totally free. He is self-existent and therefore self-determining from all others. Now, this one is a little bit deeper. Okay? Now, listen to this. Listen to the argument. You have to follow me. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? He says, by no means. But then he quotes Exodus 33, and it says this. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now, at first glance, that doesn't seem like an argument, does it? It just seems like a restatement of unconditional election. I get a pick, that's it. But Paul is arguing. Remember, that's the flow of it. So what is the argument for us here that Paul quotes Exodus 33? How is that an argument to support his statement? Why does he quote Exodus 33 here? What's the point of that? Well, he is quoting that verse from Exodus 33 when Moses asks to see God's glory, right? And then God responds back this way. I will make my goodness to pass before you 
and proclaim my name. And then after he says, I will proclaim my name, Yahweh, he then says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So are you following me here? Here's what it means. So when God reveals his name to Moses, after Moses says, show me your glory, he says, I will reveal my name to you. And then he quotes that statement, right? I will have compassion. I will, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. What he is doing here is he is, attaches to his name the action of being totally free and independent of all creation. He is saying, I am Yahweh. I am totally free to do what I want. I am self-existent. I am who I am, independent of all beings. Therefore, I act in this way, and I can show my mercy on whomever I want and whenever I want. That's what it means to be God. He's independent of everybody else. So the argument Paul is giving here is saying, for unconditional election, is saying, Yahweh is sovereign, self-existent. He's not like anybody else. Now, sometimes that makes people feel un uncomfortable. Your answer is that he's God? Yes. Yes. We are not sovereign. We are not self-existent. We are not self-independent or reliant. But God is. And that's one of the attributes that makes him God. Amen. Try, try that for a mind bender, right? That God never didn't exist. That's what makes him God. That's what separates him. Now, some people might say, well, I can't understand it. I go join the club, right? <laughs> We're not supposed to be able to understand everything, right? We are supposed to be able to worship. This makes God look distinct and big. Why? Because he is. He is. He is not like us. If I ask Isaiah to do something and he doesn't understand, that doesn't nullify his obedience and the truth that I've asked him to do. Now, third, why, why is this important again? To display his glory. In verses 17 through 18, he brings up Pharaoh as an example. Now, remember, Pharaoh's in conjunction with showing his mercy, but this is the other side of the coin for unconditional election, right? I will pardon whom I will pardon. So, some will say, well, he hardened Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh hardened his own heart first, and then God just kind of, well, if that was the case, why doesn't Paul just use that argument? Right? You see what I'm saying here? Why doesn't Paul just say that? Does, wouldn't that leave a lot of questions for us, right? Because it says that, um, I lost my place here, but the scriptures say to Pharaoh, this very purpose I have raised you up and I might show my power in you that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. And I know some people want to go back into Exodus and say, yeah, but Pharaoh hardened his heart first. Is that the point of Romans 9? No. The whole point that Paul is arguing here, he's using every fiber of his being, is to say, God is sovereign. He didn't harden Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart because God wanted to raise him up to show his power. That's the point. He says the answer to display his glory. If the answer is, well, God hardened Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh hardened his heart, then the whole to display his own glory is not included in Romans 9. Why was Pharaoh raised up? To display God's perfect holiness and wrath and supreme power over the ruler of the known world. And that he could put him down like that. And rescue whomever he wanted, whenever he wanted, and however he wanted. It's all about God's glory. Everything. So when we say that God is just and free to show his mercy on whom he wills and to harden whom he wills, we are saying that God is God and operates independently outside of creation. 
He is self-existent and therefore free to do as he pleases. He is the only sovereign. Now, let's look at the third and final point. God has the right to do what he wants with his creation to display all of his attributes. Okay, last section. Romans 9, verses 19 through 24. You will say to me then, why, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? Speaking of Pharaoh, right? What's his answer? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another vessel for dishonorable use? What if, this is a hypothetical question, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And that word in the Greek means fitted. In order to make known the riches of his glory for the vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. So here, Paul gives us a direct answer, an unmistakable illustration, and two deep reasons for why God does it this way. Number one, the direct answer. Again, Paul knows what's coming, and it's very natural to, to ask this question, right? Well, why does he find fault? How can he do that if he just rose Pharaoh up and hardened him? How, is that, how does that work? Is it just their robots? And he answers the question very clear and direct. Who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Now notice the contrast. Who are you, O oh man? There's seven billion people on the earth. To answer back to who? The one and only God. Again, he's emphasizing God's deity, that God is God. Right? He's saying, listen. You're missing the point here. I'm God. You're a man. Lovingly, know your place. It's one thing to ask a question. It's another thing to question God. And Paul is making it very specific here. Not okay to question God. It is okay to say, Lord, this is hard. I don't get this. Please, please, please help me. It's not okay to go, is that right, God? Was that the right decision to send that hurricane there or that tornado here or to save this person and not this person? The Lord would say, who are you, oh man? And then he backs it up with a what? With an illustration. And it's unmistakable. It's unmistakably clear on why he uses this illustration. The clay illustration. And what it's basically saying here is, that you don't have the wisdom to weigh in or evaluate my sovereign choices on these matters. I am the potter, you're the clay. And notice this here, that they're taken out of one lump. The vessels of honor and the vessels of dishonor, right? What lump is that? Adam. We're all brought into the world bent out of shape, born despising and hating God. That is what the scriptures say. So, the illustration is unmistakable because it's from the same lump and all, again, are actively singing against God. And yet God, in his infinite purpose and infinite mercy, chooses vessels of mercy and vessels of dishonor, vessels of wrath. But then God goes deeper. And I think this is the deepest answer on why God does it this way. And I hope that I can articulate it well enough. Number one, he does it to display his wrath to make known his power. Again, why did he raise up Pharaoh? We touched on this in point two. To put him down. To show his power. Now, a lot of people have a problem with that. I've used this illustration before. We should praise him for that. Pharaoh was a wicked, evil man. How many of us, when they finally tracked down Osama bin Laden and shot him and killed him, said, yes! 
I know I did. It wasn't because I took joy in that Osama bin Laden went to hell. It was because I said justice was served. That was the right thing to do. And that's biblical. If a man sheds a man's blood by blood, his, his blood shall be shed. Right? The idea here is, is that he makes known his power through the vessels of wrath. But then also it goes into the reasoning, right? In the very end there, it says, in order to make known the riches of his glory to the vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. When the vessels of mercy fully embrace and fully understand that they were unconditionally elected out of the same lump as the vessels of wrath, and that they too very well could have been a pharaoh or a hit lord, or your unbelieving neighbor who just refuses to believe the gospel. It should cause us to worship God in a deeper way. The vessels of mercy have no chance or hope to boast against the likes of Pharaoh, of Hitler, or your neighbor. It should cause the vessels of mercy to go, but God. It was only God that did this. It was not me. God is God and we are not. Again, I keep saying it. And when we embrace this in the fullest sense and realize that we could not have done it on our own and would not have done it on our own, but it was done specifically for God's own divine purposes, for his own glory, it should cause us to worship him in a deeper and more intense way. Now, I want to just close with five concluding thoughts here. I said I wasn't going to touch on personal responsibility during the message, but I felt like it would be um, appropriate to do here. One, just because we have asserted that God is absolutely sovereign in all things, including salvation, does not mean that man is not responsible. And you can see that from Romans. Romans 2 says this, He will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and for honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. Those who what? Seek by doing good. All of those things. But then it goes on to say, but for those who are self-seeking, and do not obey the truth, but obey righteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, for the Jew first and to the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. That rubs against what we just taught for the last 45 minutes, does it not? It sure does. When you ask people like John MacArthur, Bodhi Bakum, all of those guys, they all say the same thing. They're both true. I have no idea how it works, but I'm not called to do that. Listen to what John Piper says, one of my favorite quotes. This will, the will to believe is saving, and the will not to believe is damning. We are held responsible for both, but underneath both is God's free and unconditional election, who will be saved and who will not. The elect believe, the non-elect do not believe. We are not sovereign, self-determining, and autonomous beings. Only God is. How God renders certain the belief and unbelief of men Without undermining our accountability, I do not fully understand. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I don't need to understand. That's why when I go to Romans 9, I don't try to defeat it with John 3.16 type of verses. I just go, this is great. I'm going I'm to believe all of Romans 9. Because I think, in my opinion, it's very clear. Just like I think other passages are very clear. So, concluding thought one, just because you believe one way doesn't mean you have to disregard the other. They can both be true at one time. Romans, uh, second, Romans 8 is true. We should look at Romans 9 and go, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing. It doesn't depend on me, right? Many of you have known that I have taken this job at Lincoln to be the defensive coordinator there. I almost immediately regretted it because I'm busier than busy. Unreal. 
And if I could get out of it without dishonoring my word, which I gave, I would. But I can't. So I won't. But if it was just up to me, I would leave. Romans 9 makes it clear. It's unconditional. God's going to make you get through this. Romans 8 promises are true for you. Four, or three, unconditional election is good news. How's it good news? No one is too far gone. He doesn't look at anybody anywhere and say, Ooh, you are a tough case. That is not how it goes. It's unconditional. Four, God is sovereign and therefore this should free us up to evangelize more freely. Now a lot of people try to knock the quote-unquote Calvinist doctrine and say, well, if God is just going to unconditionally elect people, then why do we got to go out and witness? Well, because Romans 10, 17 says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But when I know that God is sovereign under all of it, it frees me up. I can just do it in love and compassion and say, Jesus died for your sins. Repent and believe. That's why in 1 Corinthians 1, right, Paul says, I don't spend all my time on all these fancy arguments. I just proclaim the gospel. Why? Because God promises in his sovereignty that everybody from every tribe, tongue, and nation will be saved. So I don't have to worry about the fancy arguments. The things that save people aren't defeating their arguments on evolution. It's the blood, baby. It's the blood and the resurrection. So when I deal with my principal, or a lot of the coaches are letting me witness to them, I go, I don't care about that argument. I go, let's deal with your conscience, man. You have sinned. Jesus is the only way. He died and he rose again. You must repent and believe. He loves you. Come to him. And God is sovereign. That's the only way it ever works. That freed me up as soon as I really took that home. I go, okay, if I can get over the whole scaredy cat thing and, and, and it, you know, kind of the, the shame of the gospel sometimes, right? If I can get over that and God empowers me, I'm set to jet. I'm good to go. Because it's the blood it saves. It's the resurrection that matters. Because God is sovereign. And finally, number five. And this one is very dear to my heart. Romans 9 is the God of the Bible. A lot of people try to skirt around texts like this because it makes people feel uncomfortable. And I understand that, but I also understand that it's really wrong. God doesn't need or have a PR man. He had one. His name was Jesus, and he was perfect. We don't need to change the God of the Scripture to fit any kind of cultural or time safe. That's not how it works. Again, we have emphasized, and, and we celebrated this last week, right? We celebrated that Pastor John, I think you would all agree that, at least for me, and I didn't speak directly for my family, I love his singing, I love his gregarious personality, all of those things, but the thing that I admire the most is when he's in here, I'm going, to get the, I'm going to get the skinny. I'm going to get the straight scoop of what the God of the Bible is like. Romans 9 is the God of the Bible. It separates him from the modern God of the Bible where he tries to fit in to make everybody feel comfortable. And No, Romans 9 causes you to plant your feet, square up your shoulders, and to say, He is God. I am not. Some things are hard for me to grasp. But I still give him all praise and honor and glory. He does everything for his own divine purposes. And I'm on board with that. Amen. He'll do what's right. right. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. I uh, went longer than I had expected today, God. And I pray, Lord, that we would use this um, in the way that you see fit. Um, it just, it's so hard to convey certain things, Lord, through... Um, a broken man, vessel, um, person, anybody. Um, but I pray that we would look at Romans 9 and be comforted as your people and take it and realize that we can go to the lost, dying world and say, hey, we love you. Believe the gospel. And that's all we need to do. 
could lovingly tell people the gospel, to love them like Jesus loved them, and to just be faithful, Lord, and that you'll get the glory. You'll sort everything else out. We love you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name. Go ahead and open your hymnals to uh, Cam 43. All hail the power of Jesus' name.
comforts upon you and give you peace.